Tuesday morning to you. Today is Tuesday, November the 17th. And I was a little messed up, mixed up. I was, for some reason in my mind, I was thinking that this week was Thanksgiving week until, um, I don't know. Um, I, I, is it an age thing or is it just so much going on sometimes that we, we get confused like that? But next week is Thanksgiving. And so looking forward to that a little over a week away. I hope uh, all of you have enjoyable Thanksgiving day and time with your family. Just to let you know, next week, uh, the week of Thanksgiving, we will not be doing the daily devotion that Thursday, Thanksgiving day and Friday either. And so it'll be a short week next week. But just to let you know, uh, some of you are asking, well, what are we going to do after we finish the Psalms? Well, we haven't finished the Psalms. We have one more day tomorrow in Psalm 150. But if you've noticed, I've been skipping over Psalm 119, and my intention with Psalm 119 is to take each stanza, 26 stanzas of Psalm 119, and do the daily devotion out of each one of those stanzas. As you know, it's the longest book and uh, the longest psalm in Scripture, and so we'll take about 26 days uh, to go through that. So it should carry us through the month of December in our daily in the Psalms. And I'm really praying about what to do in January. I do want to continue these daily devotions. Uh, I think uh, there's merit and there's value in that. And I think it's uh, a means of getting us together in the word as the body online. And so my intentions are to continue. I'm just not sure what book we will start going through in the mornings, but we'll still do the same thing. I'll just share with you uh, out of what uh, what comes through through my reading in the Word in the morning and my quiet time and share some thoughts around that. And so um, if you have any suggestions, I know that's not a good idea, but if you have any suggestions, just let me know of, of what might be edifying uh, to you in the mornings. Um, but I thought about doing the book of Leviticus. Um, no, that's just a joke, but it is a great book. Uh, today, though, we're looking at Psalm 149, and very similar to um, uh, Psalm 148, it begins with calling us to praise the Lord, to shout to the Lord, uh, to shine forth His glory, to shine forth His majesty, uh, to boast about God, to brag on who He is and what He's done in our lives, and there's plenty to brag and boast about that. But the exhortation here, again, in verse 1 is sing praise to the Lord, sing uh, sing to the Lord a new song. And I've said this before, and I got a little bit kicked back, but, you know, <laughs> we do like the familiar. Uh, but I, I really believe that in our lives, as God continues to do more and more and more, there should always be new songs of expression, of worship to Him. Uh, God is not an old, stale God. Uh, and we remember those things of God, but at the same time, daily when he's active in our lives, working in our lives, and we see his work, it should generate from our hearts a new expression of praise, a new song to the Lord. And notice what he says here, this. I, I never saw this in this verse, the end of it. He says, his praise in the assembly of the godly. The assembly of the godly. In our application, it would be in our corporate times of worship and praise. But notice the pronoun. He doesn't call it our praise, but it's his praise. And we're reminded that, that as we sing praises to God, it ain't about J-Mo, it ain't about you, it ain't about anybody else. It's all about him. And the moment we make it about any other person other than him, then it's not genuine praise and thanksgiving. And so he says we're to sing our praises, our, his praises to him. They belong to him. They're directed to him. They're not directed to the audience, although the audience, if you will, I hate using that term, but the congregation is edified by those words that we sing and express. Um, there is a direction to him that we're to give praise to him. It's, they're his praises. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Uh, two, two descriptions that he gives of God here. God, our maker, our creator, and God, our king. Because he is our creator, he rightfully um, has the place of king and authority in our lives. And so when we praise him, we're to recognize that he is our creator. He has made us. He has created us for his purposes and his glory. We belong to him. 
And he is our king. He is our ruler and he's our master. He's to be Lord in our life every day and everything that we do. And that requires on our part a submission to his authority, that we humble ourselves before God and say, God, uh, this life that, uh, that I live is not mine, but God, it's yours. Lord, how do you want to rule? How do you want to reign? What authority do you want to have in my life? God, what is it that I'm not willing to relinquish over to you? What situation am I not willing to put in your hands? God, you're king. And so this morning, let's acknowledge him as our maker and our king. Let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. We're to praise him with dancing before him to express in all that we are, all who we are, to, to, to just express to him. Can I say to all of us Baptists, it's okay to dance. It's okay to dance before the Lord. Um, and he calls us to give praise to him. Notice it's not for a self-satisfaction or gratification, but it's to, uh, to praise him. Then he says, let them praise his name with dancing, making melody to him with tambourine and lyre. With all types of musical instruments, let us praise him. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. Don't you love that? Sometimes we get the feeling and idea that God doesn't take pleasure in us. Can I remind us this morning that because of the blood of Christ, because we have been saved by him, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. We have been adopted as his children. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are a part of his family, and he takes pleasure in us. While it's true, sometimes our actions wouldn't warrant pleasure, thank God that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all of our sins, and he can look upon us and embrace us because of the righteousness that we have attained through what Christ has done for us. He takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. Um, it takes a humility uh, to come before God, to recognize that, that God is who he says he is, that we are so who he says he is in his word apart from Christ and to humble ourselves before him. And he says, he adorns the humble with salvation. No one can come to Christ with an arrogant pride thinking they can do it themselves. If they have, then they've never been saved because it takes a humility, a, a recognizing that God is holy, we're not. And the only way to have a relationship to God is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so, um, he adorns those who have come to that place with salvation. Let the godly exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. At night when we lay down, uh, may we be able to sing for joy uh, and to have that peace of mind that gives us a rest. Let the high praises of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands. Now, it's in this verse that he kind of shifts a little bit of idea. First, he's calling us to praise God, to give glory. And now he is calling on God for vengeance on the enemies of the people of God. Now, in David's day, when he wrote this, there were literal enemies uh, of the kingdom of God. There were literal enemies of Israel. And he's going to begin to cry out that there would be vengeance from the hands of the righteous where they have been oppressed, they have been brought into suffering. Uh, perhaps he's thinking about the Babylonians. I, I don't know who he's thinking about, but, but he's calling on a warfare there. Now, we as God's people, at, at least at this time, don't have a literal nation. We're not a literal nation of God. We haven't replaced Israel, um, but, but we have enemies as well. But the enemies that we face... Uh, unlike the children of Israel, where they face both physical enemies and spiritual enemies, we have spiritual enemies that we face. And so here he cries out, uh, let the people um, with a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nation and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the judgment written. This is honor for all his godly ones 
Praise the Lord. Now, as I've said, our enemies are not physical enemies. They're not physical nations like the children of Israel faced. But I have been reminded so much lately in my own life that, that we have spiritual enemies that come against us. And so for the application of you and I as a part of the body of Christ, the church, we still do battle. We still do warfare against the enemies of God. But they are not physical enemies. They're spiritual enemies. And so I want to close this morning with reminding us that that we do face a spiritual battle. And to read the words of Paul in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, where he spoke of that spiritual warfare that you and I face, and what our ability and means are in the battle against that spiritual warfare. Um, he, he begins in verse 10, and this is very applicable to me today. I, I've, for the last several days, I, I've just felt intense spiritual warfare. And I know that it's the spiritual realm where I've got to call on God to bring those things down. And I recognize that while some of the instruments of the enemy may be physical persons or entities, my warfare is against God, is against the spirit and principalities in the heavenly places. He says, finally, in verse 10 of chapter 6, the book of Ephesians, finally, be strong in the Lord. Not in my own strength, not in your own strength, but in the Lord be strong. And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 22 times that word is used in scripture about the schemes of the enemy. They are devices of the enemy. Can I tell you this, that, that Satan doesn't have any new tricks. All of his schemes are age-old, go back to the garden, uh, just like he deceived Adam and Eve. None of his schemes have changed. But we're to be aware of the schemes and the devices of the enemy, uh, that we're to stand in those, to stand against those. But the key to standing against those is not in our own strength, not in our own abilities, but in those things that God has provided for us to be able to stand in this spiritual warfare. He says, again, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Um, to use an illustration, if it's me and you, folks, your, your battle is not against me. They're, they're, our, 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 our battle is against those rulers, he says, and against authorities and against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, we have to take this in balance. Uh, we can take this to, ex to an extreme that, that we think there's a demon behind every bush. Um, my truck broke down last week. I don't think there was a demon in my radiator that caused that hose to blow, right? Uh, that was a natural thing that occurred. Now, the schemes of the enemy could have used that instance, perhaps, to cause me to, to get all frustrated, derailed, and angry at the mechanic that, that didn't quite fix it properly. Um, and so he could have drawn me into a battle, if you will, against another person. That was just a natural occurrence. That just happened. But... We need to be aware, and it takes spiritual discernment to know, to be aware as we walk in the Spirit, to discern what are spiritual battles. Is there a demon behind this instance that's taking place? And if there is, I'm not going to let him draw me into that trap. We don't want to let him draw us into that trap. But the battle, if that, if that, if that, um, if that battle rages on, we recognize that that it's through the means that we're going to talk about in just a minute that God gives us to do battle in those situations. He says our battle are against are against spiritual forces of the heavenly places. Therefore, recognizing that the battle is spiritual. Therefore. Anytime we see the word therefore in scripture, we look to see what's the therefore, therefore. Therefore, in light of the reality that we know that our warfare is spiritual, he says, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. 
withstand, to stand firm, to stand through, to not be defeated in that evil day. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. What he's referring to there is the truth of the word of God. We spoke of this a couple of weeks ago in Philippians, uh, where we're to take every thought captive, bring it into the submission of Christ, whatsoever things are true. And the thing that we have is the word of God to do battle against those lies that the enemy will try to penetrate our mind with. We weigh it by the word of God. Is that true? Does that measure up with the word of God? You've heard me say many times that my opinion doesn't mean anything. You can take it, leave it, chunk it, or flush it. It's just my opinion. I don't want to hurt anybody this morning, but your opinion doesn't mean anything. What means anything is the word of God. What does God's word say? And that's what we are to take and use that as, as the belt buckle that holds up all of that lower extremity armor. Put on the, the, the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. That breastplate that, that covers all of the vital organs in the time of battle. The breastplate of the righteousness of God. While we, not, while we may not always act right or righteous, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And so when the enemy tries to tell us that, that we are not saved, that we're not worthy, that we are just the scum of the earth, we say, no, 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 no. The word of God says that I have been made the righteousness of God in Christ through his shed blood for me. And that is a defense against taking us out. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, that gospel that has brought peace with us and God. The Bible tells us that before we were saved, we were enemies of God. But Jesus has been our propitiation. He has taken the wrath of God and he has made peace with God through his blood for us, through the gospel. Be ready in that, that we have, we're at peace with God. God is not our enemy. We just read in the Psalm that, that God, he, he takes pleasure in his people. No, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ and rest in that. In all circumstances, how many circumstances? All circumstances. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. That shield of faith, trusting and believing that God is who he says he is, that we are who he says he is in Christ, and that if God be for us, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, then who can be against us? Who can ever separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? And you can just picture the enemy firing those fiery darts. Sometimes they come out of the mouths of others. Sometimes they come out of the actions of others. Sometimes they come out of circumstances. But the enemy is always wanting to shoot fiery darts. And we're to take up that shield of faith, which when that fiery dart hits it, it deflects that that arrow, and it can't penetrate the arm, the armor and bring harm or damage. Um, he says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, the helmet of salvation, knowing that we are saved, knowing that we are born again. And can I say this, that when we are truly saved, when one is truly born again, they are saved for all of eternity. Amen and amen. And that shield, that, that helmet of salvation, which guards our mind in Christ Jesus, we're to, we're to put that on. And then he says, take up the shield, uh, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God one of the two offensive weapons that he gives us in this battle. Take up the sword, which is the word of God. How many times have I said the word of God? A lot of times. The word of God is what will stand true. It is truth. It doesn't just contain truth. It is all truth in all places, at all times, in every circumstance. It is absolute truth. 
Anybody that deviates from this word is of the evil one. Anyone who adds to it or anyone who takes away from it, God's word is inspired by him. It is authoritative in our lives and it and his name will stand forever. And I'm going to start preaching in just a minute. So let me begin to wrap this up. So take on that, that sword, the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, praying at all times in the spirit. Now that doesn't mean some gibber jabberish that we don't understand. Praying in the spirit, being led by the spirit in our prayer. That is the other offensive weapon that we have. So when we do battle, I did some battle this morning and I prayed and asked God to pull down some strongholds that are that are standing in the way of what God wants to do. The lies that that so many in the body are taking on that's perpetuated by the world and we see it creeping into the body of fear and confusion and division and distraction. That's a spiritual battle that's there. And we pray against those things because God is the only one who has the ability to do warfare against those demonic forces. And so we pray. And then he says, to that end, keep alert. Be watchful. Just because one skirmish is one uh, doesn't mean that there are not 10 other skirmishes that the enemy has laid out there wanting to, to bring us into. So praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, be alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, praying for all of the saints and also for me. Now, I'd like to apply this this morning to me. And I want to ask you to pray for me because uh, as I prepare to preach and teach every more, every week, it's not so that we can get our personal edification out of hearing a good sermon or a neat thought. No, there's warfare. And, and in these days, God is leading me to preach harder because there is a clear division that we see of those who are on that narrow path and those who are on that broad road that leads to destruction. And anytime we begin to engage in that type, that type of preaching, calling souls, there's going to be warfare. And so pray for me. Paul says, also pray for me that the words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Thank God I'm not in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So pray for one another. Pray for me that I might preach the word boldly. Um, I ran out of time this morning. There's, there's not a time for a song. I'm pressed up against another appointment that it's important for me to get to. Um, but I pray this morning that, uh, that your spirits have been edified uh, through the word of God. And that you would draw near to him today, that you'd walk in him, that you'd see his favor, that you'd see his blessings in your life. I love you. I pray God's blessings in your life. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Have a great day.